here, here. My name is Ellen Stewart. I'm the State Director for Texas and your symposium chairperson. Before we begin, I would like to thank all our volunteers for their excellent service and effort both before and during the conference. We hope you enjoy the conference and if there is anything we can do to make your stay here more enjoyable, please let us know. You saw the uh, tribute to Ron Johnson. I'm a little teary-eyed. Uh, we lost a dear friend here in Austin. Uh, I hope you remember him at this conference. He's been at practically every conference, I think. I'm sure Walt will say a few words about him. At this time, it is my duty and pleasure to introduce our MC for the symposium. He is a member of MUFON and a longstanding member of Toastmasters International. I present for your welcome, Ed Surma. Thank you, Alan. Good morning, everybody. Don't overwhelm me with your enthusiasm, please. Good morning, everybody. There we go. As Ellen said, my name is Ed Serma. I will be your master of ceremonies for this symposium. We have a very exciting conference this year. I've talked to just about all the speakers. They're going to be great, and I know you want to get this conference started. Very important announcement, and I from what I can see, everybody has already done this also, and that is to please wear your badge. Your badge is the only way we have to acknowledge that you are a paid attendee at this symposium. Our committee members were Ellen Stewart, Monty Stewart, and Dr. Joe. I don't know where you are because I cannot see a thing, but let me tell you, they worked long and hard to put these together. And in case anybody hasn't figured out, there is a souvenir slide in here. There's some golf breeze photos, there's some crop circle photos, and there's some uh, historical UFO photos. In a nice souvenir, you can view them through a slide projector or a slide viewer, but please, you know, to make them happy, make our job easier, make it easier for the CIA to identify you, please <laughs> put your badge on, okay? <laughs> I love UFO people, they're great. For those of you who have seen an earlier version, some of the early versions of the symposium schedule, you'll notice that Richard Hall is not here today. His paper is in the proceedings. However, Richard Hall had a medical problem. I believe it was hip surgery, and therefore he was unable to attend today. So please join me in sending your best wishes and prayers to Richard Hall. Make sure he has a speedy recovery. Okay, that's it. It's time to start the show. Yesterday was July 8th. On that date, 47 years ago, the United States Army Air Corps announced to the world that it had captured a flying saucer. Three hours later, Brigadier General Roger Ramey said, in effect, just kidding, that what they had recovered was a balloon with a radar target. I'm sure all of you know that this started one of the most intriguing cases in ufology, one that is still being debated and investigated today. However, that Roswell case could have died. All of the UFO cases could have died. A lot of amateur groups investigated this and other sightings and came away with ridiculous unscientific conclusions. Some groups like Grudge, Blue Book and Condon. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> However, a lot of individuals, mostly volunteers, who got no reward and sometimes to their detriment, joined together to keep studying this great mystery of <clears throat> ufology. For over 25 years, the Mutual UFO Network has investigated, published, researched all areas of UFO sightings, UFO encounters, and so on. In my humble opinion, MUFON may be the leading investigative group, may be the leading force in exposing and bringing out UFO truth for all of us. 
and it is most certainly my honor to begin this symposium by introducing the International Director of MUFON, Walt Andrus. You notice the tribute to Ron Johnson early in the game on the film, and we would like on June 9th this year here in Austin, Texas, Ron Johnson, our Deputy Director of Investigations, our Vice President of the Corporation, was attending an SSE meeting, annual meeting here in Austin. On June 9th, Thursday, he died suddenly right at the meeting, only 44 years of age, which is too young to go. We had made plans in our executive committee that we're about 10 years apart, so we have a means of succession as we go th through years. We watched other groups die after the officers died. The organization disappeared in the case of APRO. But we didn't plan to lose Ron Johnson because he was certainly an up-and-coming light in the entire field of UFOlogy, having been a member of MUFON for 20 years in several different capacities. He was also a radio amateur, and ham radio operators recognize their lost members by addressing them as silent keys. A silent key, in other words, you're no longer sending or a microphone. So we'd like to take one minute, if you all stand, and one minute of silence and recognition of Ron Johnson. Amen. Thank you. I look out in the audience, we can't see a soul. It was to recognize someone laughing at one of his jokes, and I'm glad they did it. Each year, we publish our International Symposium Proceedings. And this year in particular, since it's our silver, our 25th anniversary, we've gone with our MUFON blue from the banner, and of course, everything in silver. Also, each year we dedicate the symposium proceedings and we keep that within the executive committee so it is somewhat super secret. The gentleman that we've dedicated to this year is present, I can't tell if he's sitting out there right now or not, in the darkness. I will read the brief dedication. The MUFI 1994 UFO symp symposium proceedings are respectfully dedicated to Stanton T. Friedman. Each year the proceedings are dedicated to the person who has made the most outstanding contribution to the MUFI UFO network during the past years in advancing the scientific study of the UFO phenomena and demonstrating positive leadership as determined by the MUFON Executive Committee. Public recognition is hereby bestowed upon Stanton T. Friedman for his educational contribution as a public speaker on UFOlogy across North America, but more specifically for his stubborn and persistent determination to reveal the facts on the Roswell crash, the MJ-12 papers, and most notably the UFO cover-up by the U.S. and Canadian gov governments. It is with profound gratitude that a dedicated member of MUFON may be honored in this manner. Is Stanton present? I will present his copy when he's soon available. Also, most of you already received your copy of the June MUFON UFO Journal. There he is. Um, 
I'm glad I got invited to speak at this conference. <laughs> uh, just a very few words to say that uh, I've appreciated the opportunity to work with MUFON. I've spoken at numerous conferences. I've met with MUFON people all over the country. I don't know of a better group, in today's world at least, pursuing truth about flying saucers. The job isn't over. We've got a lot of work to do. We have to watch our own camp, make sure we check things out. If I had been invited to speak at this conference, I would have <laughs> spoken about fraud in ufology. Covering the waterfront, from Carl Sagan to Guy Kirkwood to Bob Lazar, might as well put the needle in a lot of places at once. I've talked about Phil Class at previous ones, so I won't honor him here. Uh, but I think we need to check and double check and verify. I think it's going to be an exciting year for ufology, getting the media involved. But I hope you all understand that because it's on a computer net or on television or in some newspaper doesn't make it true. Don't settle for accepting what somebody else says about any aspect of ufology. Check it out. Ask for evidence. Don't be apologist ufologist. Don't be closet ufologist either. Tell it like it is. I've never had a tomato thrown at me, never an egg. I've come on very strong, 700 lectures all over the place. It's OK to speak out. But make sure you have your facts in gear before putting your mouth in gear. So I hope you all enjoy the conference. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for the honor. On to next year. Stan pointed out that's the briefest talk he's ever given. <laughs> We must say that when he said public education, Stanton Friedman has been one of our featured speakers in more MUFON symposia than anyone. Uh, he passed up Dr. Heineck after 1986. So I'd like to turn the program right back over to Ed Sermon, our program chairman and MC. Ed? Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you for all of those moving comments, Walt. And again, I just want to echo that the memory of Ron, let's keep it alive and let's keep MUFON alive for the memory of him and people like him. I tried to be subtle here, but please excuse me for a second while I move the stool back in place. I wanted all of you to think that Carla was tall. <laughs> As Walt said, our first presenter today is Dr. Carla Turner. She was a full-time professor of English, but in 1988 her life took a slightly different turn. Her book, Into the Fringe, which is available in the vendor's area, documents her family's experiences with UFO sightings and abductions. She is now a full-time abduction researcher based in Arkansas, and is very active in publishing and lecturing on UFO phenomena. Her current work is entitled, Taken Inside the Alien Abduction, Alien Human Abduction Agenda. Her, I'm sorry, her presentation today is called Alien Propaganda, Fantasy and Fact. And so, will you please welcome the much taller and very honored Carla Turner. So that's what it looks like from up here. Thank you, Ed. I'm actually 6'2", but that's just my IQ. So. And good morning, everyone. I want to thank Ellen and Monty and the rest of the Austin MUFON organization for being such wonderful hosts for my husband and me. And this is our first time to participate in a MUFON conference, so you're making a very good impression. 
Um, I am very pleased to be able to speak with you today, especially as the uh, first speaker, because after this I can really relax and enjoy the rest of the conference. The topic of my presentation is the alien human abduction agenda, and I think it's such an important one I'm ready just to jump right in, but I think there are a few of you who may wonder who I am and why I'm up here, so perhaps I ought to introduce myself. I'm an abductee, uh, and I use that term because I have been forcibly taken and controlled by non-human entities, which makes this an alien abductee situation. Now, some of you may know about the experiences my family and I have endured. I've recorded those in Into the Fringe, which Berkeley published in 1992. And it focuses uh, most intensely on the period from 1987 through 1990, when we were forced to become consciously aware of the alien encounters that we've been having ever since childhood. And it also relates much of what we learned about earlier encounters through a lengthy investigation in conjunction with the researcher Barbara Bartlett. But I did have a life before Fringe that was very happy, very fulfilling, and I think reasonably normal considering the fact that I came of age in the 1960s and uh, the hippie generation. I do have a provocative little theory about the relationship of the hippie generation to the abduction phenomenon, but I think that's going to have to wait for another presentation. In my 20s, I traveled around the world, and yes, I did it with a backpack. I married, I had a son, and I managed to earn a couple of degrees along the way. I, I got a bachelor's in English from California State University in Sacramento. And I received a, and I know this is, sounds a little strange, but I received a master's in American studies from the university in Nottingham, England. They have a different view. It was a very unusual course. In my 30s, I settled down a little bit more, and I continued to raise my, fam my son. I also managed to earn a PhD in English while teaching college for 12 years. <clears throat> my son is now grown. He uh, holds a master's in physics. He's married and raising his first child, so there is sweet revenge in this world. <clears throat> uh, my husband and I, um, I was divorced and remarried in the late 1970s. My husband and I have moved uh, in the last three years to rural Arkansas, where we live deep in the woods on a mountainside near the Arkansas River. And outside of ufology, which for me is anything but a hobby, I, I do have other interests and activities. Uh, I love visiting with my grandchild. Uh, I study the usefulness of the wild plants that grow on the mountainside where we live. I have a great deal of fun playing with my chihuahuas, and uh, I enjoy the music and the concerts of Bruce Springsteen. So I, I do have some other interests here. Old hippies never give up their hobbies, you know. I quit teaching college in 1991, and since then have devoted, as uh, was mentioned earlier, all of my efforts to abduction research and beginning first in conjunction with Barbara Barthlick when I was in Texas, uh, looking into reports in the Texas, Oklahoma area, and then later independently, researching cases around the country. My most recent work uh, is reported in the new book, Taken, uh, that was referred to also earlier, that was published this past April by Kelp Works. And I hope we will, by the time I'm through talking, understand all of the connotations that I imply with the title, Taken. It is not just the abduction aspect that I'm talking about. As both an abductee and a researcher into other people's experiences, I feel that I have a somewhat expanded uh, context or knowledge of this phenomenon. My own experiences have taught me many things about the nature of alien activity, but that insight has been greatly expanded by the context of so many other reports I've been able to, uh, to study, and it has helped me to see well beyond the limits of the individual experience. If we judge the entire phenomenon only by our personal experiences, we're going to get a very distorted view. The context, the patterns, the unique elements as well as the similar elements are all very important for us to have a chance of a glimmer of understanding what may be behind this phenomenon. Yet even having been through these things, lived with people who've been through these things, and studied literally hundreds of 
personal and first-hand reports about these activities, I know very little about the alien agenda behind this activity. Uh, Stanton mentioned the need to hold ourselves to facts in this field. And I think that is extremely important. We should repeat that 10 times a day as we go through the work in this area. The problem, of course, with the abduction phenomena, as with a lot of ufology, is that the nature of the alien activity is designed deliberately to keep us from having much in the way of concrete evidence. Designed that way. It is not an accident. <clears throat> so it is difficult to feel confident of many facts. The dictionary defines facts as things and ideas which are demonstrably existent, objectively verified, and known to be certain. And at this point, given everything I've learned internally and from external evidence, there are so very few things I'm willing to call facts. The list is very short. So today, instead of um, regaling or educating or entertaining you with abduction case reports and photos of the body markings and the drawings of the spacecraft and aliens, which I have done and could do, I would prefer to take this opportunity of perspective, which is, of course, the theme of this MUFON symposium, to share with you my list of facts and then try to take you beyond the fringe of this phenomenon and into the heart of the abduction scenario. Now I'm going to begin by discussing my list of facts before I go on to two other issues, propaganda and fantasy, because I think it's on the basis of the facts that I have been able to discern what I can about the data in the other two categories. So this will be a very short list. I hope you'll follow along with me. Facts. Fact number one, we do not know with any certainty exactly what these entities may be. Extraterrestrial, interdimensional, terrestrial in origin, some combination of all of the above, something we have yet to even dream of. I'm going to use the term alien merely for convenience, and I am not implying that I believe they are from another planet. Now, certainly they may well be. We just don't know, and that's a fact. The aliens themselves have identified a number of different origins to various abductees and contactees throughout the years. But of course, we humans have absolutely no way to check out any of the statements that they've made. Therefore, we cannot know these things, as the dictionary says about facts, to be certain, to be objectively verifiable. Fact number two, and I'm stating this with all of the tact and diplomacy and self-control that I can, and those of you who know me know I have very little. <clears throat> At least some of the aliens are liars. For, through the past decades, the aliens have made, and you all know this if you're familiar with your ufology history, have made various predictions and promises and given a number of very specific warnings about impending events. And we have these documented at least since the early 1950s. And you and I all know when we look at the record of what's happened since then that very few of these things and none of great consequence have come to pass. This is not a reliable source. I would like to illustrate just from personal experience uh, one such scenario that should make us question the things we are told by these creatures. In Into the Fringe, um, I recount the story of a young man that I had known since he was 11 years old. He and my son grew up together. With his family and I were close friends, and I have a great deal of confidence in who this person is and his personal integrity. He went through an intense uh, series of encounters and abductions, as we all were doing in this particular group during 1987 and 88 and 89. And one of the entities with whom he had repeated almost regular contact was an entity who described itself as an interdimensional being, uh, stating that its group was 10th dimensional and knew about the 11th, the way we know about the 4th dimension. 
This entity would appear in various physical guises during its encounters with James. Sometimes it would be a nebulous form, sometimes it would be a human-looking woman, but sometimes only her head. Sometimes her head and her hands if there was something she wanted to show him. So it varied. At one point in an extraordinary weekend of events, which are, are recorded in detail in Fringe, um, James was compelled to go out of state to a particular area. He was at his grandparents' house and was abducted in the middle of the night and taken to a hill a few miles from there where this woman materialized in, in full form this time. All the body parts were there. At that time, she told him that within five years of that date, he and uh, a few other people, including us and several others in the area, would be activated to perform our jobs, our tasks. That it didn't matter where we would be at that time, it didn't matter what we were doing or what we wanted, we would do our jobs. The woman told him he would know this was true because she was going to give him a series of predictions of events that would come to pass from this date through the five-year period. And she began by telling him about a situation that was occurring right that moment, several states away, with people he knew, so he could check this out to see if it was true. He certainly did. We all checked it out, and it was exactly true. What the woman had told him going on in the other states actually had happened, was verifiable. Of course, this made of James a believer. James was a valedictorian in a private prestigious school. He had a, a career ahead of him where the sky literally could have been the limit. But the woman had told him in five years, you will be turned on to do your job. It doesn't matter what you're doing or where you are. And you will know this is true by the things that occur. The first thing made such an impression that she was telling the truth that James's life was put completely on hold. He dropped out of college, he gave up his plans for a career, his personal relationships became irrelevant, and he thought, I've only got five years, I should party, I'll uh, make enough delivering pizza on a part-time basis that I can do the things I need to do before they take me over. I, of course, none of the rest of the events occurred, but his life was effectively um, altered to his detriment by the lies that he had been led to believe. And you know, the best way to get someone to believe a lie is to sandwich it between a few truths, which is what, of course, the woman did. The five years, by the way, ended in August of 1993, and we're all still doing what we want, where we want, and we're not doing our alien jobs. The aliens have given a number of stories to people throughout the years about who they are, where they're from, and we have a list, if you compile this, and at one point I think I tried to, a list of origin, planet origins for these beings uh, that include everything from the planet Lanacane to Banlon. <laughs> they also have given us a variety of explanations as to why they're here and why they perform certain procedures. Often, however, these uh, explanations are contradictory. And without going into a great deal of detail, I will point out just one example. Um, I report on this in the book Taken. Several people, abductees, that and I have personally worked with, have been shown cloned bodies aboard craft or in facilities. And we'll talk a little bit more about the details of these in a moment. I, just for purposes of the deception and the lying capability, I will use this little story. Pat, who's one of the cases in my book, was shown a copy of her body that was in storage with a number of other human bodies. She was told it was for the resurrection. And if you know your Bibles, you know when the resurrection comes, we will all get new bodies. Pat was raised in a very simple Christian fundamentalist background. The aliens, throughout their encounters with Pat and her family, had used the religious symbolism to to bond with the family and to instill confidence in them. They'd even had Jesus beam into the room at one point when the Greys were abducting the grandmother and say, it's okay, they're with me. <laughs> Pat was told that this body, this cloned copy, would be her new body for the resurrection, and this was extremely moving and religious for this woman. However, another woman, uh, also reported on in the book, 
was shown a copy of her new body in an entirely different scenario, of course, and was told, in fact, if she didn't cooperate with the agenda the aliens had picked out for her, she could be replaced with that body and nobody would ever notice the difference. And in a third case, we actually had that occur on a temporary basis. A woman was abducted on her way to work and shown on a viewing screen her clone going to work in her place, and nobody knew the difference. So are these bodies for the resurrection, blessed by God himself, or are they threatened potential replacements? Aliens didn't get their stories quite straight in those cases. Fact number three. In encounters, the human's perceptions are controlled, as are the human's conscious memories. Now, you already are very familiar, probably, from the work of Hopkins and Jacobs and others with the concept of screen memories, uh, especially at the onset or at the conclusion of an abduction event, right? Uh, someone may see a, a strange owl instead of the E.T. or a, a little gray rabbit by the side of the car instead of an E.T. or a beautiful deer, whatever. These, we're familiar with these screen events. What we may not be familiar with is the fact that the screen techniques go well beyond such temporary uses in the phenomena. And we'll talk about that a little more later also. Uh, we're talking about control in fact number three. It's also a fact that the perception of pain can be controlled and is controlled during these encounters with the particular abductees, as are feelings of physical pleasure, often sexual pleasure. And, of course, the human's emotions are also controlled during these encounters. The fact is, you are in control of these creatures during every encounter, to some degree, more or less, normally more. Fact number four, false memories can overlay and disguise the actual events of an encounter. And even with regressive hypnosis, the abductee may recall false scenarios. I'm not talking false memory syndrome as so much as been ballyhooed lately in the press. That's not what I'm talking about. The abductee can recall false scenarios, even under regressive hypnosis, unless some effective method is used in the hypnotic process to help the abductee bypass implanted illusions. Uh, some of you have heard me talk before, remember uh, an illustration of this concerning a woman named Joy, who in the 1970s had an encounter at missing time and relocation episode in California. Was driving in one town two hours later, she's in another town, has no idea how she's gotten there. She's crying, she's in hysterics, and she feels totally abandoned and betrayed. Twenty years later, when um, additional incidents occurred and finally compelled Joy to seek out some help to find out what was going on in her life. One of the events that she looked at under hypnosis was this two hours of missing time in the early 70s. She recalled in the initial stage that she was taken aboard a craft and brought by a regal and awe-inspiring figure who looked like the king and had on the robe and was you know, very uh, much in charge into a room much like this stood before a podium much like this, gazed out into an audience of wonderful smiling little greys, not at all like this, <laughs> thank God, and was given a book and told to read this book to the audience. She looked at the book and it had uh, blue symbols or figures on it that she had never seen and she said, I can't read this, I don't know what these symbols mean. And she was told, just put your hand over each symbol, you'll receive the impression and then recite what you received to the audience. So Joy did this and she would touch each symbol and as she did, she would mentally receive a very warm, uplifting, wonderful spiritual message which she would then recite to her audience. And she went through doing this, said the response she got was one of such love, such overwhelming acceptance. Uh, she was really awestruck by the experience. Uh, when the therapist, uh, the hypnotist asked her to move forward, there was a jump, a gap in her story, and suddenly she's back in the car, crying, hysterical, and feeling very abandoned and betrayed. Now, as you know, that doesn't match up. There's a discrepancy between the emotional state she was in in the car and this wonderful, awe-inspiring spiritual experience she had recalled. I think you'll agree they don't match up. The hypnotist noticed this, noticed the gap, and asked Joy to first program her mental computer to perceive only the truth, and second, to back up to maybe five or ten minutes before she was in the car. 
When she did, Joy found herself in an extraordinarily different situation. She wasn't reading a book to an, a loving and warm audience. She was naked, suspended in a beam or tube of light, being poked and prodded by a group of aliens who were using her much as a biological chart uh, to explain, as we might to students, this is what this part does, this is what that is. And then she was put on a table, tilted at an angle, and was forced to endure some sexual intrusions. At this point, Joy, who could not move or talk, was mentally screaming to God and to Jesus, with whom she had very great faith, to help her, to save her, to make this stop. And when it didn't, and when she went through this for an extended period of time before being returned to her car, Joy came back a changed person. Abandoned and betrayed, she felt, by her God. Although she had no conscious memory of this event immediately upon her return, it changed everything in her life for 20 years. Her religion, her sexual orientation, everything about the woman. But without having the programming and help under hypnosis to see past delusion and perceive only the truth, Joy would have been one of those persons telling you how wonderful it was to be with the great alien brothers. She would have never known why the trauma and the after effects she carried for 20 years existed. Fact number four on my list is that, or sorry, fact number five. Given all that I've said so far, it is effectively a fact that abductees like myself and so many of you, while we report our experiences honestly and sincerely, we are really reporting alien-controlled information to the research community. As abductees, our situation is this. We can see the aliens, but we can't believe them. And we can't believe what we see them do. And I know this from personal experience as well as from a number of other investigated situations with very honest, very sincere people who are telling you, just as I have told and others have told you, what we honestly perceived as happening. We're being honest, but the illusions and false memories and distortions and controlled perceptions and emotions and responses that we had do not accurately reflect always what we really went through. Fact number six, there's a serious element of human involvement in the abduction phenomenon, in addition, of course, to the very real alien participation. You all know, of course, about many abductees, their reports of being monitored, harassed by human agents of some sort, cases of phone intervention, uh, mail intervention, helicopter surveillance, etc. And I wish I had an hour just to talk about the human side of this phenomenon, which of course I don't. Now, in Into the Fringe, for instance, I did report about my husband's abduction and interrogation and threats by the military group in 1988. Similarly, at the time, I had never heard of such a thing, and I found it even more disturbing than the alien encounters. Similar reports, though, have been made by a number of other abductees, some of whom I'm sure you're familiar with, such as Leah Haley's case, uh, Alicia Davison in California, and some of you may be surprised to know Debbie Jordan. And part of her experiences reported a very similar human abduction and interrogation. It just never quite made it into print for some reason. In Taken, there are four more accounts of women whose lives have been intruded upon by what seems to be military human forces. And although I'm not at liberty, as so many of us aren't in this field of where confidentiality is everything, to present to you the hard evidence that we have been able to gather in some of these cases, I am convinced by the evidence that we do have in a number of these cases, it's not an alien illusion of military. We've got names, dates, places, bases. It's real. Fact number seven. Whatever else it may be, the abduction agenda involves quite physical, physical aims and procedures that tend to belie the idea of a primarily spiritual motivation on the alien's part. And much of what we see in these procedures goes well beyond the alleged aim of a crossbreeding program. 
If you think the aliens are only interested in making hybrid babies, then I invite you to figure out what these following procedures have to do with the process. First, you're aware of the various type of implants into number, numerous areas of the body, uh, into the brain, through the ear, into the neck, into the spine, into the legs, the hips, and even in one man's fairly notable case, into the penis. Some of these implants have been seen on x-ray, CAT scan, and MRI. Some of them never show up. Some have been physically recovered. But so far as I'm aware today, and I do invite those who may know better to please correct me on this, whatever analysis has been performed on these objects has not given us any sensational new information. We still don't have any proof of what these things do in our bodies. What about the insertion of wires and tubes into abductees in the chest, in the kidneys, the ovaries, the wrists, the knees, and the feet, as well as the taking of human body fluids and the injection of unknown substances into the body in various locations? What about the brain operations? which in the statistics that I've been able to look at in a very general way without running them through the computer, seem to turn up as often, almost as often at least, as the reported taking of sperm and ova. In the cases reported, the individuals who've undergone or think they've undergone, because you always have to have that in the back of your mind given illusion, who have undergone these experiences use almost identical terms in reporting what has happened to them. I felt like my brain was, my head was opened up and my brain was taken out. What about the deliberate pain experiments meant to produce levels of pain in the abductees apparently for the measurement, study, or pleasure of the aliens who are observing them? I reported on one of these with James in Into the Fringe. He was put through an extraordinarily torturous and traumatic experience, having holes drilled in a row through the top of his head. He received an apology for this. Sorry, but we had to do it. But no explanation for why he had to do it. And most people are not given an explanation. What about the other bizarre tests and procedures that are reported time and time again? Um, abductees immersed in water or some liquid in which they're then forced to breathe the liquid. I think Hopkins and Jacobs have made this fairly well known to you. They now include it as one of the standard procedures. What does this have to do with crossbreeding? Are being forced to eat or drink unknown substances that, that then produce a variety of after effects on the abductees. Uh, Angie reported on and taken was given a, a bitter red liquid to drink passed out immediately and came to in a very passive, hypnotic state in which she then went through an interrogation with a number of people. Ted Rice, another case that I've been working on for a couple of years, as a child was given a pill to eat or swallow that then produced on the 10-year-old boy the effects of an aphrodisiac. What about being forced? to engage in a variety of sexual, not reproductive, but sexual situations with alien beings, with human looking figures, and with other abductees. Frequently the alien sexual activities are reported to be carried out by reptoid looking beings, but not always. We've got reports of gray sex, hybrid sex, and Nordic sex, among others. And as, uh, just as in one of Hopkins' recently uh, reported scenarios, I think it was on television last year uh, on sightings, um, I described and taken how Lisa, one of the abductees reported on here, was forced to have sex with another abductee in one of her encounters. It was, it was an extremely poignant situation um, after the fact. The man told her, apologized to her, told her how sorry he was that he was being forced to do this to her. He said, they've been taking me since childhood. I don't know how to stop it. And he gave her his full name. That's all he had in his control to do. What about the cloning? I mentioned this earlier. And I'm not talking about just the potential and I think very uh, evidentially supported idea that the little gray workers you're all so familiar with, like the little guy down here on the floor, are cloned produced, manufactured like, you know, we do Fords, Chevys, not just this kind of cloning of the same sort of creatures to go out and do the work, but also the cloning of human bodies, which as I said have been shown to abductees. Sometimes they match and are identical to the human in, in the situation. Sometimes they're just a bunch of identical bodies, inert, adult, 
bodies. In one case, a man was taken to a facility in which he saw a room in which there were about 40 inert human bodies, 20 male, 20 female. The males were all identical to each other. The females were identical to each other, and they were beautiful, blonde, healthy specimens. What do these things have to do, is what I've asked you to think about, with the crossbreeding agenda? Fact number eight, all of the things that I've described to you so far are part of the aliens' physical aims and procedures, but that isn't all there is to their motivations. The agenda also involves the long-term psychological programming of the abductee. It targets, among other concepts, our social and personal relationships, our sexuality, our political ideas, and our religious and spiritual concerns. For instance, many of us, through our experiences, and I think I could get a show of hands on this, are made to be highly suspicious of our government, now perhaps with good reason. And in general, we become less trusting and intimate with people outside of this field and very paranoid often of people within this field. As one of the uh, women in the book, Jane, uh, in Taken, has said, the aliens had fostered in her mind a mistrust of the government. Certainly it has changed most of Dundee's spiritual concerns and social agenda. With Pat, also reported on Intaken, the aliens, as I mentioned earlier, used a religious approach in their contacts with her, telling her very early on that they were angels, but, as they said, not as you've been taught. And they even had Jesus, as I said, appear in her bedroom to give us okay for a subsequent multiple family abduction event that occurred that night. Um, Pat told me about this as her brother and sister who also remembered the event and said that uh, Jesus had blonde hair and blue eyes and was very beautiful and wonderful. And I pointed out that you know, this is physically inconsistent with the historical Jesus that we know about from the Bible. He certainly probably didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes. And Pat could only say, well, this one did. On socio-political terms, abductees often find themselves obsessively interested in ecology, animal rights, globalism, but I've yet to see the really hard evidence other than the ecological side of this, that this is a result of alien programming or a response, a human response to our own experiences, which tend, when one goes through trauma, to make one much more empathetic to others going through trauma. On more personal terms, um, abductees often go through specifically sexual obsessions, dysfunction, and compulsions. Now because of the personal nature of, of sexual situations, I'm sure that so many of these reports I, I wish we had available to us are not well known in the abduction data body, uh, such as other things like sperm gathering, ova gathering, fetal extractions, baby presentations, and so on. Now I know those two are very intimate and very personal ex uh, scenarios, but it seems that humans, we humans, are even more sensitive about our sexuality. And if you've ever known someone who's had um, a sexual assault, no matter how traumatic, unwelcome, intrusive, and criminal the event may have been, the person tends to carry, without a lot of help to get over it, a sense of shame and responsibility. This is also true for abductees. In private, although these reports are not often made public, in private abductees have reported not only straightforward sexual encounters during abductions, as I mentioned earlier, uh, but also the aftermath of such encounters on their lives. You would might be surprised, and again, you might not be, to know how many abductees report obsessions or compulsive masturbation after their experiences that they do not have control over. Overwhelming sexual appetites. Conversely, the loss of all sexual appetite or the fear of sex, as well as sexual obsessions with people the abductees normally would never be attracted to. Fact number nine. With their advanced technology, the aliens can create virtual reality scenarios that are usually absolutely real to the perceptions of the targeted abductee. 
Now, such capabilities have often been theorized and hypothesized and discussed in this field, but for me, they were confirmed in an extraordinary case, multiple case, that I uh, that have helped research for the last couple of years involving an abductee named Ted Rice. This is the one story I do intend to tell in detail before going on. In the early 1990s, Ted was in Florida visiting an old friend named Marie, and she had also invited a third friend, a woman named Frances, as a house guest. Ted was in one room. Marie and Frances went to bed in twin beds in the other room. Shortly after going to bed, Ted heard his hostess, Marie, screaming, Ted, come here quick. And he hopped up out of bed, ran down the hallway, and as he approached the other bedroom, he could see a, a blue glow coming through the open bedroom doorway. When he walked inside, he saw a very strange situation. His host, Marie, was pinned as far away, uh, up against the wall, as far away from the bed area as she could, staring fixed at one of the twin beds in which Francis was still lying. The bed was surrounded by a large, spherical, blue energy field of some sort through which little lights seemed to dart and move. Marie was, uh, I'm sorry, Francis was raised in a slightly raised position just as she had been starting to sit up in the bed and had been paralyzed in that position. Ted and Marie yelled at her, what, you know, are you in pain? Can we help you? What's wrong? She could barely hear them, and when she did answer them, they could barely hear her, and this is in a small bedroom. She, for several minutes, they observed, was carrying on a conversation with the ceiling. And then a few minutes later, she was carrying on a conversation with the foot of her bed. A few more minutes passed, and the sphere of electrical energy disappeared and Marie was able to move, I'm sorry, Frances was able to move again. When she sat up, she told them what she had been experiencing. It had begun, she said, hearing the sound of a helicopter low over the house. And in fact, she had turned to her hostess, Marie, and said, what's a helicopter doing over the house this low, this time of night? Marie said, what helicopter? I don't hear anything. You're dreaming. Go back to sleep. Frances said, no, don't you hear that helicopter? At that point, she had started to sit up. That's when the blue sphere of energy had coalesced around the bed. Frances told them after this was over that the, it had seemed as if the ceiling dissolved or disappeared. And I've heard this over and over and over again. And she could see through the ceiling up to the trees above the house where there was a strange crash. She had thought it was a copter when she heard the sound. But as she looked up, it was not like any copter she had ever seen. And within this were two alien creatures, which she described in physical detail, with which she carried on a conversation for several minutes. And then she said, they came out of the craft and beamed down to the foot of the bed. Didn't you see them? And where she carried on another few minutes of conversation. When the sphere disappeared, so did the aliens, so did the invisible ceiling, and so did the strange craft. Frances had not been able to see the blue sphere of light around the bed. All she had seen was a craft, heard noises, had a conversation with two alien entities. Marie and Ted, who were outside of this field watching this, saw and heard only the blue sphere. If they had not been in the room to observe this, Marie would have, uh, Frances would have believed with all sincerity that she had had exactly the encounter she thought she had, but she didn't. Fact number 10, and this is the last in my short list of facts, it is a fact that the aliens show a mysterious interest in the human soul. And I say mysterious because of the kinds of things they do and say concerning it. Now this part of the phenomenon is so rarely uh, discussed in public that I don't think we really have a good pool of data to proceed on a serious discussion, but I'd like to bring it up because it is a fact that the interest is there and mysterious and we should be concerned about it. There are a number of intriguing reports that we could start with. For instance, a young girl who uh, the aliens ask if they could borrow her soul. Two of different abductees, totally different, totally uh, isolated from each other. It happened to both come from the St. Louis area, both shown at the age of five 
a gigantic metallic spherical object somewhere in space, and we're told in essence it was the Seoul Recycling Center. Reports of abductees who recall apparent past lives in which they've inhabited alien bodies with their souls. And even in one case, uh, a man who watched as his young body was killed and his soul energy released, captured in a container, and taken to a new replacement body where it was reintroduced into the body through the technology of the little black box you might have heard about in some of these cases. For me, that's the end of my list of facts. So I'd like to move on to the other two categories, beginning with propaganda. Propaganda is defined uh, as any association, system, or concerted movement for the propagation of a particular doctrine or belief. With me on that. What I've learned from my own experiences and the research into this field with others shows me that the aliens are clearly practicing such programming. And they are propagating a number of beliefs within abductees and through their reports to the UFO community specifically and then to the population in general. They shape our beliefs in part, at least our beliefs about them in part, by the physical appearances they appear uh, to us for one thing. And through the virtual reality capabilities that I just described to you, they can and do give us any illusion they choose during abduction scenarios. One young man, a, a, a young boy abducted with his grandmother in a situation I don't need to go into at this time, uh, was brought, had brought into the room the grandfather. It just happened the grandfather had been dead for six years. Uh, another case in which, uh, other many cases in which celebrities or well-known figures are used to, uh, in a scenario, to persuade an abductee to participate in this or that other uh, procedure. Jesus turns up very, very often, and he's always blue-eyed and blonde hair, and I'm sure that doesn't, you know, maybe if we were in India we'd get Krishna, I'm not sure. Uh, masking entities when the illusions have been seen through, and they often are. And one I think particularly important, although I've cited it before, I think it's worth repeating until the entire account and into the fringe. Um, a young man who was compelled to go out of his house in the middle of the night, as we, you know, under control, you go where you're supposed to go, and there is some evidence we get up and take ourselves out to be abducted, whether we know it or not. Um, compelled to go outside for an encounter, and there waiting for him was a Nordic, a beautiful blonde woman. Uh, probably the spinning image of Simyazi, who was waiting with open arms and a loving look, a little bit attractive, alluring look, in fact, for him to come into her arms. And he reached out, she reached out for him and drew him towards her, and being under control, as we always are, he went for it. Expecting to get an embrace and a kiss as the arms wrapped around him, the image of Simyazi disappeared. And what was holding him was not blonde, beautiful, or human. And what he got was not a kiss, but being thrown to the ground, pinned down, with claw marks the next day around his neck where this had been held down, while well, a two-foot rod of some sort was rammed down his mouth, down his throat, and into his stomach, where the extraction of juices then took place, leaving him with the external claw marks, the scraped throat, and the taste of bile for quite a while afterwards. The aliens foster a belief, I think, in their beauty and their compassion with us through such means as showing us pretty people. I think they realize we're not as smart as we think we are, and that we often equate beauty with goodness, and you and I both know that's not always the case. They also foster a belief in the alien-human crossbreeding scenario uh, through such repeated procedures as fetal implants and extraction, sperm and ova gathering, baby presentations, and so on. But I think, as Stanton warned us early on, we should remember that without external confirming evidence, we cannot accept this as proof. If we believe the aliens in our race can interbreed, however, it serves a lot of propaganda purposes. It makes us think we have some shared commonality which makes us more receptive to their presence and activities. If we think we share offspring with them, this belief binds us to them even more so, 
just as royal marriages used to try to bind competing political parties when one wanted control over the other. The crossbreeding scenario also can lead us to see ourselves as subordinate to the aliens and dependent upon them when they tell us this is the only way your race is going to be able to survive. And they reinforce our dependence on them by warning us of the impending disasters from which only they can save us. I wish I had time to discuss what they may really be doing with the sperm and ova and fetal material they take from us, but I have yet to see confirmed proof that it has anything to do with hybridizing either their species or ours. Through the manipulation of what we think they're doing and what they tell us, they also propagate the belief that their intrusions are ultimately beneficial in purpose, in spite of the fact that so much of the specific abduction events are painful, traumatic, and debasing to the person involved. We have many well-known accounts, abduction accounts, or should I say contact accounts, in which a person has been given a very positive, uh, spiritual uh, experience, sometimes with physical healing or expanded intelligence, psychic abilities, and these abductees feel very compelled to go out and tell you about their situations and proclaim that the spiritual benevolence of the aliens is, is all there is to it. And such reports can almost make you forget about the numerous other reports in which abductees experience great pain, suffering during their abductions, as well as severe, sometimes even fatal, physical after effects and emotional distress afterwards. Some apologists for the aliens call such problems unfortunate but unavoidable, as if they were privy to the do's and don'ts of the alien conduct. But if inflicting pain or permanent damage can be controlled and, and avoided in certain cases, we can have and do have the right to ask why is it not extended to all abductees, which it certainly is not. Um, just real quickly, one case I reported in Taken, Beth, a Puerto Rican woman, abducted in the late 1970s along with some of her children and her husband, went through a series of very strange physical and spiritual events during this abduction, afterwards suffered with a persistent weeks-long rash that no one could explain, severe nausea for days afterwards, headaches, blinding headaches, severe hair loss, and such damage to her eyes that she developed cataracts, and she was a very young woman. This call for surgery, of course, to remove the cataracts, and the surgeon found evidence that she had had previous eye surgery, which she, of course, had never had. We have reports over and over of, of diseases, distress, sometimes fatal situations following immediately upon abductions, as well as the wonderful healing cases that are out there. They do exist, but if they exist for one, why do they not exist for all? And I think we need to ask that. The prop uh, propaganda techniques also include perpetrating good cop, bad cop situations, or good alien, bad alien situations. Um, you know how many accounts tell of, of, of painful traumatic events taking place during an abduction, and then they stop when the good alien enters, the friendly one, the protector who makes it all better and takes away the pain. Binds us to them, we've got a helper. Reminds me of what goes on in some of the abduction and hostage situations we've been familiar with over the years. These things tend to instill in the abductee a sense of awe, a sense of fear, a sense of vulnerability, and in a very, very strange way, a sense of bonding and identification through that protector alien figure, making us subordinate and vulnerable in our relations with them. The aliens start early in the abductee's life to instill notions that the abductee somehow belongs to the aliens, is alien property, sometimes telling children, as they told me, that they are their parents, that the human parents have, are not the real parents, that they are our, we are their possession. Aliens say they have the right to do the things they do to us. They never show us, however, the warrant for that right. They, pro they foster our belief in the crossbreeding agenda. And if all we had to go on was the data related to this, that would be a very acceptable theory. But I hope I've made clear to you by what I've presented heretofore, that's certainly not all there is to the phenomenon. In a handful of cases, well, I, I, I don't have time, we're coming to a limit here. Abductees have even seen these wonderful hybrid fetuses that, that are supposedly going to either save their race or our race, depending on who alien you're talking to at the time, deliberately destroyed 
in one case, blended up as we would do a milkshake, and when the woman, in great distress, protested this, was told, in effect, by the alien, don't get so excited, it wasn't really alive anyway, and don't worry, we won't waste any of the physical material. I wish I could go into a, se a series of other reports along this line that bring block after block of evidence upon which to build the idea that we should not accept hybridizing and crossbreeding as the agenda, but again, time is of the essence. Programming also occurs with the sexual scenarios that are carried out, and again, without getting into the details, they are mostly reported by abductees to be invasive, unwelcome, and traumatic, having after effects on the sexuality of that person, sometimes for years afterwards, uh, there are a lot of details we could discuss, maybe during question and answers we can. But in general, alien propaganda seems designed to promote the superiority, the proprietary nature and the benevolent status of the aliens and the subordinate dependent position of humanity. To close, I'd like to talk a little very quickly about the issue of fantasy. Fantasy refers in, in some of its um, definitions to Suppositions resting on no solid ground. And I think you can see already we've had alien fantasy propagated and perpetrated upon us in scenarios. I think more disturbing sometimes is the fact that there's come to be such a strong element of fantasy or fantastic thinking in the abduction research community so that we We've made the mistake of basing our theories and ideas and responses upon what is essentially alien-controlled reports from abductees that cannot be taken at face value, even by those of us who go through them. These have led to fantastic theories, those with no basis on solid evidence. And you and I have heard many, many of these statements made to the point where it's divided the community in, into, in, into a point where we now refer to camps of opinions, as if the soldiers on one side of the field are getting ready to take on the soldiers on the other. And this is not the way it should be. We base our theories on fantasy, and we're never going to find the truth. I wish I could end with this reply to one of the statements I consider fantasy-oriented. The aliens must be benevolent because they have the ability to conquer us, and they haven't invaded us. If they wanted to conquer us, they could. Therefore, they must be our friends. And my reply first is, every time a person is inducted, there is an invasion. Also, please remember, there are many more sophisticated ways to invade than to use man weapons of mass destruction. If they can control and manipulate the way we think, the things we see, and how we emotionally respond, they don't need those weapons. I have to bring this to a close, and I would like to say that we must, I think, get rid of the fantasy element in our thinking in this field. We have our own human needs and desires that, that also help shape our thinking, not just the alien control data that abductees report. We do not want this to be a bad situation, therefore we don't let ourselves think it could be. We do not want to think our government is involved in any way in this because it's too frightening. The implications are far too frightening, so we ignore them or deny them or rationalize them. We feel so helpless sometimes to affect any change in the abduction scenario that we forego focusing on the big questions and resign ourselves in effect to abductee therapy, which of course is necessary, but it's not abduction research. The point is not so much learning how to live with the situation as it is finding answers to the questions of who in truth these beings are, why they're here, what technology they possess that allows them to implant and control us, to clone our bodies, to harvest our energy and our physical material, and to find out what our government knows about this agenda and what it may be trying to do about it, and why part of that involves intimidating, surveilling, and even abducting abductees. Now, I think these are the ideas now on 25th year anniversary of MUFON when we have to look forward to where ufology should go. In the field of abduction research, these are the areas that I would advocate we concentrate our energies. In spite of whatever wishes, fears, and prejudices we bring into this, there is no room for fantasy in our thinking about the potential consequences of the alien presence. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Turner. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to, ask, like to ask you to please remain seated. The next speaker is going to start in about...